Um, so first of all, you're all very, very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And in particular, thank you very much to Tiny for taking the time out of his schedule to speak to us today. We really appreciate it. Um, before we get into the interview, I'm just going to say a few words about the Society and the award itself. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about Tiny's career after that. Um, so the Law Society was founded in 1933. And for 87 years, the Society has strived to provide its members with opportunities to socialize, to engage in discourse, and to experience new phenomena. Uh, the Praise Elite Award is an integral part of that endeavour. It is given to those who have left an indelible impact in their chosen field and who have advanced discourse and societal thought in the process. The award was founded by Mary Robinson, a former auditor of the Law Society and, of course, the first female president of Ireland. Rightly bestowed, the recipients of this honour include Sir Bob Geldof, Sarah Rafferty, Max Schrems, Lord Newberger and Samantha Power. Recipients this year include Liam Gallagher, Stephen Fry and Nicola Sturgeon, to name but a few. Tiny is a British rapper, singer, composer, and entrepreneur. He set up his own entertainment company, Disturbing London, with the aim of providing a platform for young artists alongside his cousin and manager, Dumi Abaruta, in 2006. In 2009, he was signed by Parlophone Records and boasts seven UK number one signal, singles, including Pass Out, Written in the Stars, and Not Letting Go to Date, a figure which eclipses esteem artists such as Queen. He also boasts a number one album, Discovery. This year in particular, the Law Society wishes to place an emphasis on empowering students, not only in their careers, but in their everyday lives. It is for this reason that Mr. Okogu, more commonly known as Tiny, has been nominated. His incredible career in music, as well as his philanthropy, not only matches the awards criteria, but exceeds it. His work has empowered and continues to empower young people across the globe and encourages those from all backgrounds to pursue their dreams. The profound level of success he has had, not only as a musician, but as one who forged their own opportunity by setting up their own label, is inspirational. Similarly, his charity work with college graduates, Nordoff Robbins and the Prince's Trust, as well as his commitment to spirituality is a testament to him and the positive impact he has had on the world around him. This is not only worthy of commendation, but thanks. And so without further ado, and with particular thanks to our sponsors Evershed Sutherland, it is my sincere pleasure to, um, unfortunately virtually, uh, be far better if this was a Trinity office, <laughs> uh, present Tiny with the 2020 Praise Elite Award. Uh, which I believe has been posted to you, so I actually can't hold it up. But I haven't even got it yet as well. It's still it's still on the way, man. I would have loved to help. Uh, I would have loved to have held it up right now, but no, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the speech. Um, to be receiving such a prestigious award from such a prestigious law society as well means a lot. A globally recognised institution, one that I was meant to be at this year, one that I've been at previous years before. You know, um, it means so much to me, man. And I feel like I'm still at a stage in my career where, you know, I didn't really feel I, I would be recognised or acknowledged in this kind of way. So, yeah, to, to hear that was just really touching and it was an absolute honour. Thank you for choosing me. Oh, it's an honour to have you. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, oh, thanks, man. Let's get into a bit of q and I suppose. Um, I was watching back on a few of your past interviews and one thing that you mentioned that I thought was quite interesting was that you said that London is one of the only places in the world where you can live in a council block and see a beautiful semi-detached house across the street. And yeah. That, and that was inspirational for you. And I was just wondering how exactly did that motivate you and how big an influence has your upbringing both in London and also your African roots as well, which I think are particularly uh, poignant in your new music as well. Mm -hmm. um, how much of it? Yeah. yeah, no, um, no, you're right, actually. Um, for me, I think it's just seeing is believing, right? So you're, you're, whatever econ socioeconomic environment or background you're from, um, unless you see otherwise, it's your normality. Do you get what I mean? Just growing up with your parents, you know, your mom, your dad, and just being in your household, whatever it is, unless you have something else to compare it to. Um, you know, obviously now it's different with social media and stuff, but just growing up and not having any of, you know, any access to those kind of tools, seeing is believing. So for me, I was very, I felt, I always felt very fortunate to have been born in London, to have grown up in London, because you could see wealth. Um, and I, I wouldn't say I was motivated by wealth, but I was definitely motivated um, by changing my socioeconomic background and changing um, the environment that I grew up out of, you know, that was something that was a huge motivating factor for me um, and definitely kind of inspired the way I worked and, and whatnot. So, yeah, I think just being able to see, you know, real wealth and to, to see, you know, a, 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 a level of difference, you know, in your life compared to someone else's um, gave me everything I needed to kind of get up and, and, and 
go and get it. And I feel like London is one of those places that, you know, there's so much access. It just depends on opening the right door, you know, bumping into the right person. And so I guess it just made me want to come out of my council estate and just start utilising, you know, the area around me and utilising the city that I was in. Yes. Um, absolutely makes definitely makes a lot of sense. And it's definitely seen in your music as well. I think the influence is pretty clear. Um, yeah. your, your story, you kind of touched on it there. It's very one of, very much one kind of, of self-made success. So I was just wondering, what was it like first trying to break through? And did you always know that you'd make it or were you surprised at how big you got some and like, um, I was definitely, definitely surprised at how big I was like, like gonna like become definitely surprised, you know, even looking, looking back at the last 10 years and whatnot. But um, yeah, I think when I first started, you know, I'm sure it's kind of the same in Ireland, you know, I'm watching everything now with the Irish drill and, you know, all these new scenes and styles of music that are emerging from Ireland. But you know, when I first started, rap music, grime, whatever you want to call it, you know, black music in general, you know, it was it was respected, but it was very niche and it was very marginalised. And I don't, I don't feel like, you know, the wider music industry saw the equity in it or the power in it at that point. Um, and so it was almost like a little bit of like a pipe dream, to be fair, like it's a hobby that's never going to amount to anything big. But I guess the love kind of kept me there. Um, and I guess... I'm not going to lie, just inspiration from my American peers. So everyone knows 50 Cent and Eminem and, you know, so just being able to see what they were doing on such a large scale just kept 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 me believing that this could happen. Um, and yeah, against all of the odds, against all of the like laughter and all of the doubt and all of the kind of like indirect kind of bullying, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, like people just do nothing sort of vibes, you know, <laughs> when you're watching that show, like, what are these guys doing, man? It's never going to turn into anything. Um, but yeah, you know, times change, the tide moves. Um, and yeah, if you stick, if you stick with what you believe in, similarly, you know, I'm not going to say it's the same, but similarly with, you know, how people are making a full career out of gaming now you know if you if you stick with what you believe in against all the odds and you know whatever people think at that time you never know you might just end up being a leader or expert in your field and I guess that's kind of what happened in my situation when it comes to like UK and and you know British you know Euro, Euro rap yeah probably just doing what you enjoy I guess probably... yeah just doing what I loved man whether whether there was going to be any financial reward or not and slowly but surely it all paid off um so i suppose that kind of led you on to pass out obviously was your was your big breakthrough i suppose and you were quite yeah. young when that happened which i think people kind of um don't really pay much attention to but was it strange being pushed into the public eye at such a young age and um, and did you feel at that stage that you had made it or did it put a bigger pressure on you to sort of keep trying to do bigger things um no great question I feel like in hindsight, um, yeah, before you get pushed into the public eye, there should be some sort of, you know, training, therapy, um, you know, some, something along those kind of lines, because I, I feel like no one's really prepared for it. Even though now we're in a time, you know, where you can just do something, you know, random on social media and you're pushed into the limelight, you know, for 15 minutes of fame or whatever. But I think I feel like as an artist, you know, or, you know, an actor, anyone that's, you know, going to, you know, like Trinity College was featured in normal people. Right. So let's say those actors, for example, you know, anyone that's going to be on a mad platform, I feel like they should have some sort of therapy or, or some sort of um you know, psychological preparation before. Um, in my instance, that didn't happen. And obviously, you know, I've come from like a working class background, parents that are pretty much, you know, Nigerian immigrants, had had me in the UK, obviously had my siblings in the UK. But there was no real, you know, there was no real kind of like, advice or information on what to do or how to do it or whatnot. So in hindsight, that was definitely, um, kind of like a baptism of fire, if you will, do you get what I mean? Just being thrown into the deep end. Um, but it all worked out, do you get what I mean? Because I definitely think pressure makes diamonds and I feel like that's kind of what happened in my instance. And in a lot of instances, when you see some of these, you know, UK rappers emerge from some of the most hardest backgrounds and end up becoming this, this, this massive thing. So yeah, I feel like that was definitely difficult. And then in terms of, um, but I guess when you're 21 and, 
you know, all your adrenaline's going and you're just so excited to be on like a tour bus. You're not really thinking about it that much. Um, and did I ever feel like it was going to be this big? No, I never, I never thought that because like I said, rap music was something that at that time, and it's always important to put it into context, it wasn't really taken that seriously. Like the equity wasn't there, the value of it wasn't there. So yeah, I guess in my mind at that time, I never saw it how like it could be now, if that makes sense. No, I, d I didn't think it could be this big. Um, so obviously at the, at the beginning, and I, I suppose still now, um, your cousin Doomy played a massive role in your career. Um, and I was wondering how important has his influence been and exactly how has he helped you along the way? And also just if you could elaborate a bit more on Disturbing London and how that came about, I suppose. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, in terms of all the things I mentioned, in terms of, you know, just having that kind of, um, you know, just, just that little bit of therapy or that level of comfort, you know, when you've been thrust into such a extreme situation um, or position or scenario, he, I, I feel like he's been, you know, pivotal in my life, you know, for, for mainly that reason. And um, just, just sharing the belief with me and being that person who, you know, could go out and negotiate the deals and, you know, to be honest, do a lot of important things that moved it along and that, did actually create equity and value, you know, within our genre of music and within our, our sort of artist. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, having that ambition as well, you know, Disturbing London was something that we both spoke about, but it kind of came as a result of like labels not wanting to sign us at the beginning. So, you know, it was good seeing someone like him, my older cousin, someone that's, you know, six years above me being like, don't worry, we're going to just set up our own thing and we're going to make it happen and we're going to shoot our own videos and we're going to do this and that and that. And I mean, yeah, at that time, you know, I was, I was, I was 16 and he was, you know, just early twenties and yeah, I, I guess looking back at it now, you, you know, it, it, it was definitely impressive because there wasn't that many people from my community that were that driven and that motivated and that ambitious in a field that we didn't really have that much knowledge or, you know, support um, with, to be fair, or for. So, yeah, I guess that's basically how Disturbing London started. And that's kind of the role that he's played in my career thus far. And we're still doing things to, to this day, you know, still picking up acts, still you know, trying to build our label and carry on, continue growing it and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been an amazing partnership. Um, so you mentioned obviously you're, you're still going at the moment. And I, I suppose from, from album to album, even from discovery to demonstration, the sounds kind of change quite a bit um, mm -hmm. with, with your new singles, such as mm -hmm. um, Wapa yeah. <laughs> and uh, Top Witters. Um, they're obviously very different to the types of song the ad on Discovery when you first broke through. And you also obviously dropped the tempo from your name, so it's just tiny. Yeah. yeah. Is that like, is that an intentional thing to kind of change your image, I suppose? Or is that just part of growing older and I suppose having new influences on your music as well? Yeah, I feel like life is a journey. And I feel like, you know, everything you said at the, at the very beginning, you know, before we started the Q&A, before I accepted the award, um, I feel like that's, you know, that's all been my journey up until this point. But, you know, just like with life, you know, for anyone, you change, you evolve, you grow, you know, at school, for example, or, you know, at Trinity, you might have had a nickname that everyone calls you and then you come out of Trinity and then you're in a different scenario. And I feel like just on the natural course of my life, this has been a good moment for change and for um, evolution because I've realized I'm gonna always do what I'm doing and I'm always gonna experiment with sounds and work with different producers and and whatnot. But um I feel like I feel like go like 2020 for example is like a kind of like just a new there's just been a blanket over like the sort of life we've lived prior to this point. I feel like there's a the zeitgeist has changed is probably the best way to describe it and it feels like a completely new time. Um, and so, yeah, I just felt like it was fitting for this kind of new landscape that we're in. Um, and then, yeah, like I was saying about the sounds, being being that British boy that's come out of that, or, or that African kid, sorry, that's come out of that London council estate, I obviously have a lot of influences um, within me anyway. So just being African, for example, Nigerian, 
coming from essentially like a, a working class environment where you're surrounded by Turkish people, Indian people, Polish people, Albanian people on a, on a norm and just, you know, Spanish, whatever, and just being able to absorb Italian, ab Irish, absorb all of their influences um, because you're just exposed to it on your council estate or on your block. Um, it was always like a dream for me to be able to go out into the world and work with like loads of different artists. Like even with some of the music that I'm working on now, I've just come back from like the Caribbean and I've been collecting records with like Sean Paul and Chronix and all of these different sort of artists. And for me, like some people might look at it and be like, it's very different to WAPA or that's very different to Pass Out. But for me, it's just like a, it's like a dream come true to sometimes be in the studio with some of these guys and to be somewhere in Colombia and to be, you know, watching somebody rap in Spanish or because the sort of life I would have had if it wasn't for music, I would have never been able to see any of this stuff. And so I'm literally like grabbing it all by the reins and absorbing it all. And, I, you know, I want to be able to tell my kids in the future and my grandkids you know I was here making music with this person because you know like like we said at the beginning of the interview I was I was always willing to do this whether there was any financial reward or not so seeing as there has been and there continues to be I'm gonna really just make the most of the opportunity that, that I've been given and yeah just even pay it forward to the next generation as well so like I said we've been signing other you, you know new artists new generation artists you know you know new rappers new singers new songwriters and yeah i want to be able to impart all of that knowledge and experience on them for them to be able to go out and be the best version of themselves but yeah i'm just having a whale of a time still being able to just make music and experiment and do different things and you know it's, it's it, it goes without saying you know that the world has changed vastly in the last couple of years and and it's gonna i feel like it's changed irreversibly as well you know we might go back to some of of, of how we used to live before but you know for me it you know the feeling in my gut and my soul it, it honestly feels like we won't so yeah i feel like this new tiny guy kind of works <laughs> i feel like he works for this time you obviously mentioned there that music was kind of central to, to everything that you wanted to do and also that you were obviously very driven starting out um, yeah. Also, I've been very successful outside of music. So obviously, with so you're wearing the what we wear T-shirt there. Um, yes. Also, uh, oy, oy. <laughs> <laughs> um, also uh, you've had other business projects as well. So I was just yeah. was that kind of always part of the plan, or was that kind of just something that came about with the music, or had you always had an interest in that? I suppose beforehand. Um, yeah, I mean, probably fifty-fifty. Like. I I guess music is always the thing that was at the forefront of my mind and tried to achieve something in music. And I guess I'd be lying if I said, you know, when I was 12 years old and I had that kind of epiphany that there was all these other things that would have come with it because I guess if I didn't have that sole focus, I wouldn't have been able to achieve the heights that we've been able to get thus far. Um, but then I guess at the same time, like I said, life, you know, as you grow up, you know, when you're a teenager, you're exposed to something or you see something, you you have a role model. And then when you're in your 20s, you have a different type of role model, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I feel like, yeah, just, just kind of like watching our hip hop counterparts in America, to be honest with you, um, and always kind of like considering myself as someone who was kind of intelligent and more than you know, more than the stereotype of, of, I guess, how a rapper was perceived stereotypically, and I would say even ignorantly kind of stereotypically, of course. But um, yeah, I always felt like I was more and I wanted to do more. And I like, again, you know, just a simple question when you, you know, you talk to your kids or your grandkids, what do you want to say that you did? And you know, I always wanted to be known as a rapper, but I always wanted to be known as someone who, you know, did lots of business, you know, whether it was in within music or out, I wasn't sure. And then slowly but surely, you know, just as life progresses, you just you just do what you know, but you just do a bit more of what you know, if that makes sense. And so I've branched into fashion, but I've mainly kind of just expanded my music business and kind of got on the other side of the chair, if that makes sense. So the artist, but also, you know, the guy signing artists now and the guy signing songwriters and, 
doing that kind of stuff. And I'm having a lot of fun doing it because I, I always said to myself, I want to get to a stage where I can just have my own studio, walk in, there's this bursting with talent, you know, from all over the world, you know, and, and it literally is not in this COVID time, but usually, and I can just take my shoes off and just sit down and, you know, have a little drink, back a Guinness, which I actually really love to be fair, but the Nigerian version. Um, and then yeah, just enjoy myself, enjoy, enjoy my evening. And thankfully, you know, so far, this is where I've got to in my life and it makes me feel very happy and very rewarded. So yeah, I'm just gonna continue as, I, as I've started. Um, I noticed recently that I think what we were doing like a Black Lives Matter collaboration. I was just wondering if you could explain yeah. that and kind of what it means to you, I guess. Yeah, so basically um, uh, we've we linked up with the Black Curriculum. Um, it's, a, it's a social enterprise that was initiated by um, a very talented 23-year-old girl called Lavinia Stennett. Um, and basically they just run, you know, Black history courses up and down the UK where I live obviously and they're petitioning to get black history permanently in the UK curriculum because you know I'm not sure how it is in Ireland but you know being black you only learn about history your history within a certain context which is usually around slavery or you usually hear about your history during the month of black history do you get what I mean but obviously Black history is way vaster than just the, the narrative of slavery um, and way more vast than a couple of iconic figures, you know, in the month of October. So it's something that I very much believe in. And it's something that, you know, I'm just so proud to see the next generation still fighting for and still campaigning for. So, yeah, I feel like I just wanted to raise more light and attention to their cause. And obviously from all of ourselves, all of the profits and proceeds have gone to them and, you know, to continue supporting whatever they're doing. So, yeah, that that's something recent that we've done with what we were. Brilliant. Um, you mentioned there just before that, obviously, you love walking into a studio and seeing, like, loads of talented people. And obviously, throughout your career, you've worked with some amazing artists, such as mm -hmm. Labyrinth, Calvin Harris, Street Order, KDB, Big Sean, uh, Eric Turner as well. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favourite person to collaborate with? And I guess, if you do, why are they your favourite? Um, I, I guess with everyone that you've mentioned, I've learned different things from each of them and I've, I've been inspired by differences from all of them. Um, favourite, I would say one of my favourites, just in terms of like being a fan of his music and never knowing that we were going to cross paths in the way that we did and, and build a friendship in the way that we did, I would say, was Calvin Harris. Because yeah. like I, I, you know, I went out all those years ago and bought Acceptable in the 80s. Um, and I was listening to all of his kind of like real electro kind of like house records back then. And just just as a fan, you know, like I said, just growing up in London, exposed to all of these musical influences. And I, ne I never even saw myself like working with him like that. And one, in all fairness, before I got signed, I did a cover of one of his songs, Girls. Remember that song, I Get All The Girls, I Get All The Girls. I did a cover of that just not thinking anything of it. And then, yeah, I guess five, six years, five, six, seven years later, we're in the studio, we're shooting a massive video in LA. And um, I found myself as a rapper, quite fortunate because I've been able to branch off into other genres of music. And I was able to, to do um, some incredible house, coll house collaborations with iconic, legendary house DJs again, like Calvin Harris, but also Swedish House Mafia, et cetera. And so I've been fortunate to have like residencies and stuff across the world, you know, in like Ibiza and Dubai. And so that is also places, those are also similar places that someone like Calvin Harris would be as well. So, you know, seeing him in Vegas, seeing him in Ibiza. And yeah, we've just, we've just, uh, obviously he's the most successful DJ in the world, but I just found myself being around this guy a lot more than I ever thought I would. And he's just such a sound guy and he's, he really just genuinely loves music. And, and um, you know, I can't, I can't speak for him totally, but he's someone who genuinely seems to just love music and, you know, is dedicating his life to that. And he's just, you know, he's like, he's like our version of like a superstar DJ Iron Man, even when you see the way he's like living and, stuff like that it's just been really inspiring to watch this guy you know that made acceptable in the 80s go on to become one of the most successful djs in the world so yeah i'd say probably him 
And how, how do those collaborations come about? Like, is it is it like a Twitter DM and they, they ask you to do it? Or is it... Is it yeah, I mean, it's, it's... Yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes you might bump into someone at a festival and then build a relationship there. Sometimes, you know, people drop into other people's sessions. But then, yeah, like you said, you know, lots of people be in the DMs where that's kind of how it goes. You know, everyone's <laughs> sliding in left and right, left, right and centre. And yeah, to be honest... I guess for some people that that um, process kind of don't like it kind of um, what's the word it takes away from the imagination of how music is made but the fact is we're in the future now so you know even the most recent tune I did more life with a producer called Torrent Foot from Australia literally just DMs man and the song can be made in a couple of days and you never even had to meet. Good Israel Adesanya shared out in that one as well. Yeah. Say that again? Israel Adesanya line. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, man. I had to give him a mention. That's my guy right now. Um, I just have one more question. I'm not sure if there's any Q&A questions from those watching, but um, it's kind of a vague one. So it's basically just what is one piece of advice you give to aspiring musicians and students? Um, okay, so for the aspiring musicians, um, just do it for the love. Just do it for the love. Everything has to start from a place of love um, and, you know, think about all of the benefits and the, the rewards later. Um, and that should just guide you because at the end of the day, what I've worked out is happiness is just doing what you love. and be, it's, Happiness is subjective, I guess, but for me, I've found it's not about anything financial or, you know, tangible like that. It's just being able to wake up and do what you love around people that you love and and for me it doesn't really get more complicated than that so for anyone that's trying to do music obviously have an end goal have an end destination but yeah just do it for the love and for all the students out there enjoy your time you know make sure you study hard you guys are very privileged to be in the institution that you're in um but yeah, enjoy it. Just enjoy it. It's just going to be one chapter of your life and then there'll be another chapter after that. So just give it your best shot. But more importantly, just enjoy the ride. Perfect. Um, we just have one Q&A question here from uh, Willie Farrell Kelly who asks you, um, will you be coming to Trinity Ball next year and do you like Irish girls? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've always thought Irish girls are very beautiful. Um, and yes... I'm very funny, very clever as well. Um, and yeah, always had nice eyes. So that's what I've always thought, to be honest. Um, and am I, am I coming to Trinity Ball? If you guys invite me, like I said, I was meant to come this year, but COVID messed us up. So fingers crossed we can all be clear for next year. Brilliant. And just the last one here is, how important do you think the grime scene has been to you and your music? The grime scene has been kind of like uh, pivotal for me and my music. I guess it was like a... It was like a a bed, a genre, like a, a place for me to come from. And so, yeah, I've always given credit to, you know, the pioneers of that, the Dizzy Rascals, you know, the, the Wileys and the likes of, because if they, if they didn't pave the way, I guess there wouldn't have been a space for me to emerge from, you know, and ultimately anyone that gets big becomes a popular artist, you know, anyone, you know, from any genre of music, whether it's rock, whether it's rap, whether it's, you know emo music whatever it is um but yeah grime definitely was my where i did my ten thousand hours man it's where i got to get on the pirate radio it's where i got to go back to back with the best of them it's where i made my initial kind of music friends and i started being able to collaborate with musicians that was all within the context of grime so yeah it was hugely um, pivotal and instrumental in my career and then um, just for you, just before you go, you mentioned there obviously the kind of the Irish music scene and the Irish drill scene and stuff like that. Are there any Irish acts in particular that you think are are good or? Yeah, so I've always I've always liked Reggie Snow, but um, Mister Affiliate is I think his name is Mister Affiliate. The, he's jumping on drill music at the moment. Um, I think he's spending a lot of time in London at the moment. But yeah, I really like him. If you guys haven't heard him, you should check him out. He's come with like a different flow and a different pocket of rap that I haven't really heard. So I like him. And then I really liked Hair Squad as well, man. I, I don't know if Hair Squad is still putting out music, but I really did like Hair Squad too. Um, I think that's pretty much all we have time for. So um thank you so much for joining us today we really appreciate it and that's all good man thank you very much and it's, it's an honor to 
to be acknowledged by you guys. So, yeah, much appreciated and all the best to you guys too. Hopefully we'll see you in May for Trinity Ball. Um, Fingers crossed. That'd be nice. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you.